Welcome back to Infinite Scroll. I'm Lauren. I'm Jordi, and we're the co-founders of Gen Z digital media brand Centennial World. And this week's deep dive is on... Shadow banning. The who, the what, and the why. You were so excited to I say know, that. I know. Actually too <laughs> excited for a topic like shadow banning. <laughs> So essentially, we had a listener actually reach out and ask us to look into this topic. And we really like a balance, you know, mm-hmm. with Michaela last week, you know, sometimes we love doing a creator deep dive, but also something more neutral, yep. like a topic like this yep. is actually really interesting. So when it got brought up, we were so excited to look into it. So for those who don't know, shadow banning is a term influencers, brands and users of social media all use kind of freely and regularly, especially with the right of TikTok in recent years. From politicians to conspiracy theorists, the term is used a lot to explain or excuse an alleged lack of engagement on content or accounts. However, it is also something that is increasingly hard to define or prove. So this week, we're going to look at what shadow banning is or seems to be, how it has evolved over the years, and look back at some of the most prominent or loudest circumstances shadow banning has been reference. But before we dive in, we just want to quickly remind everyone to remember to rate, review and subscribe if you enjoy our content. It's so helpful for us to grow and it's so amazing to be receiving your feedback. Oh, and we have one quick review to read out that we forgot to read out from Tuesday. So Tessa said, infinite scroll girlies. I've been a fan of the potty since the morbid 2020 lockdown. (gasps) Love your potties. Every week they bring me so much joy, including the life updates. Thank you so much. And I think this goes to prove it. Thanks for making such good content. Keep going. Thank you. Oh, my God. Our merch, when we make merch, we're going to make merch next year. Like, just putting it out there. Just putting it into the universe. We have had these plans for a while, but we're going to make merch at some point next year. Scrollers and keep going, maybe. And Rat Girl. And definitely Rat Girl, yeah. Because that's, that's good, like yeah. foundational to <laughs> our brand. But yes, thank you so much, Tessa, for the feedback. Everyone else, if you haven't given us feedback yet, please leave us a review. It helps us so much. Interact on Spotify or send us a DM. And just a reminder, too, we have our newsletter that goes out every Friday and our Geneva group, which you can sign up to be a part of. So you can engage with us on every front, be hearing mm-hmm. from us every day of the week. Okay, so without further ado, let's dive in. So we'll start with a definition. We love a definition. Mm-hmm. So according to social scheduling tool slash platform buffer, shadow banning is the act of muting a user or their content on a platform without informing them. So as algorithms are often tech platforms best kept secret, it is no surprise that with these algorithms, platforms like TikTok and Twitter quietly control co- what content is seen and what is not. So we've spoken in the past about TikTok's ability to hate certain posts And that was actually a viral moment when that kind Mm. of got revealed. I think it was by the Washington Post potentially. But information came out from ex-employees at TikTok that they were essentially choosing content to go viral. But of course, that also works the other way around. And the same can be said for the demoting or hiding of certain content as an alternative to flagging it for community guidelines, blocking it or deleting it. So the conversation explains, quote, this opaque practice is called shadow banning. And to put it bluntly, it is a form of content moderation. So when a user or content is shadow banned, it can often still be accessed, but does not appear in search. So shadow banning can also include burying a user's comment under the, all the rest of the comments on a post. A research paper by the sex worker collective Hacking Hustling notes that shadow banning is an insidious strategy used by platforms because they can still actually make ad revenue off the user and keep the user on the metadata collection, but the user essentially loses their voice. So as Buffer notes, the term shadow ban isn't the first iteration of hiding participants and their content online without telling them. The practice has had many names over the years, including stealth banning, hell banning, ghost banning, the being sent to Coventry, <laughs> which is just so random and hilarious, um, comment ghosting or even toading. What? I know, it's so random. The internet, strange place. Yes. According to the New York Times, the term shadow ban traces to at least 2012 I actually saw even earlier references citing it appeared on the website Something Awful in 2001. 
Quote, when Reddit users accuse the platform's administrators of banning a link to a Gorka article while publicly championing transparency. So in its infancy, the term shadow banning meant something very specific. Quote, it was a way for online community moderators to deal with trolls, shit posters, spam bots, and anyone else they deemed harmful by making their posts invisible to everyone but the posters themselves. So while the term, like we said, started out being very specific, it's taken on a new meaning in recent years and users apply the term quite frequently uh, to describe their general discontent with the amount of attention they should be getting on a social media platform. So people say all the time, like everyone will have heard a creator they follow say that they've been shadow banned because they get low views when what they really mean is that they think the algorithm's like not favoring their content for some reason. And that could be like literally anything. Yeah. And like TikTok is so inconsistent anyway that I think often it's like almost an excuse of them being like oh this video didn't do very well oh I'm shadow banned I must be shadow banned yeah well Annabelle asked us yesterday if we think we've ever been shadow banned on Centennial's account because we have had the account now for like you know four-ish years almost and there's periods of times where like literally our videos will be getting like 700 views Mm. for like every video for like months and I never it literally never crossed my mind that we could have been shadow banned I'm just like that's just how TikTok goes completely (laughs) and I think that's where TikTok you know has uh people hold them less accountable in a way for that because it's always been inconsistent yeah and the way that we think about it too is so funny if we do post a video that gets like a million views we're like well TikTok's not going to give us two of those in a row so whatever we post next is kind of like a sacrificial post yes that we know is going to get low views but it is funny because we probably have been at some point yeah like now after doing this research I'm like oh yeah we probably actually have been somewhat shadow banned Mm. in that category at some point in those periods of time but like it just I just would have never considered at that because I'm like I'm not important enough to be shadow banned yeah literally (laughs) like we're not saying anything that important at the end of the day but the way that shadow banning works now is much more nuanced and it is a usually algorithmically enforced b informal in that it's not explicitly communicated by the platform and c ambiguous since there is no concrete form of punishment for creating content that the platform doesn't want other people to see so from the Atlantic by Gabrielle Nicholas says as quote, shadow banning is the unknown unknown of content moderation. By definition, users often have no way of telling for sure whether they've been shadow banned or whether their content is simply not popular, particularly when recommendation algorithms are involved. And I think the recommendation algorithms are really interesting too. We're in such a unique era of social media platforms where because for a time, even to this day, every platform is trying to be everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like YouTube is going short form content, long form content, you know, Mm -hmm. Twitter's introducing features that make it feel like TikTok, Instagram's copying TikTok in lots of ways as well, that what they're prioritizing and pushing out is genuinely changing every day as far as like what they want creators to be adhering Mm -hmm. to. So I think sometimes people get those priorities confuse and they're like, well, my content's not doing well. It's like, okay, well, Instagram has told you what it wants from you. Yes. But you're not like kind of keeping up with the changes that they want to see, which obviously is a different conversation, but. And I think creators are, understand that content has to evolve, but it's never evolved at such a fast pace, right? Like TikTok really changed the game for that because with YouTube, there was like a certain style of video that was popular and the algorithm liked for, you know, a period of time. And it was like years. Mm. Whereas now it feels like, TikTok went through this evolution where they really liked off the cuff, Mm -hmm. user generated looking content at the very beginning. And then when they introduced green screen, they loved green screen. And it was like green screen was everything. And if you made a green screen video, it was guaranteed to get like a million views. And if you made any other type of content on an account where like a green screen could have been used, you got like 700 views. Yeah. Heaven forbid you make a dancing video in (laughs) 2022. That's not going to bode well. Yeah. And then, you know, as they introduced new features and things like that, It all shifts. And I also think part of it as well, they started deprioritizing green screen videos. And a lot of people who use green screen, like commentary creators and whatever, were saying like, I'm being shadow banned. 
But we had a really interesting conversation with Crystal around this time because our green screen stopped doing mm. well as well. And I remember she specifically said, do you think it's because green screen videos are more likely to be, you know, commentary videos or reporting on like news, quote unquote. And that's too risky for TikTok, especially amid at the time, it was like conversations around TikTok being banned in the US. Mm. So the creators that are using green screen are probably more often than not commentating on something mm. and they couldn't take that risk about what they were putting out there at the time. Yeah, I mean, it's also potentially a copyright issue too depending on whatever's yeah, in the back, true. even if it's credited. And even since we've had that conversation, TikTok have announced now that they're prioritizing 10 minute videos. Yeah. They want people to be moving to longer form, trying to, you know, scrape away a bit of YouTube success over the years. But like to that point, it is moving. The goalposts change every fucking day. Yeah. So whether or not you've been shadow banned or whether or not you're just unable to keep up yes. with the changes that these platforms are expecting from creators, you know, is go hand in hand at this point. Totally. Okay, so as far as what platforms shadow ban content, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, and Reddit are all believed to have shadow banned content in the past. So most platforms continue to reject the term shadow ban, but claim they do moderate content by quote, ranking or demoting posts. This claim is entirely hypocritical. This is how shadow banning is understood as a term. Nevertheless, when shadow banning has been reported, platforms often cite technical glitches or users failing to create engaging content. I think the latter like definitely, you know, is more viable, not creating engaging content to the point that we just made. But the technical glitch of it all is making me a conspiracy theorist. Oh, no, like platforms, I'm actually going to get into this a lot more like later on, but platforms who claim they don't shadow ban and it was just a glitch or it's like because of you as a user creating non-engaging content, like that is literally gaslighting. Like yes. you are gaslighting us. You are keeping all of the control. Like they literally are so, uh, this, the, the research, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. The research for this episode has made me so inflamed and really like, pulled the veil back for me on how controlling and manipulative and crazy these platforms are. Oh, completely. And they've built the creator economy up to a point now where this is people's full-time jobs and they rely on this platform and then they just take it away every now and again yes. to remind people that they can. Yes, totally. That like you're at the mercy of the way yeah. that they would like this to function. To shift the goalposts so that creators start appeasing I guess to audience demands because what what happens is audience demands change faster than creators change their content mm. right like we evolve sooner yes um wanting different types of content so the way that they convince or like I guess get the creators to do that is by like you said like taking little pieces away every once in a while or your Instagram and you tell audiences what they want and it's not because they want the audiences to have a good time on their platform it's because they don't want to lose user engagement yeah it's because they need to keep making money yes and that typically involves growth. Yeah, but they don't care about us. No, of course not. Oh, <laughs> they care about the money that we have to spend though. True. Uh, okay, so with that in mind, many of these platforms have flip-flopped over the years when it comes to explaining their policies. So they've also maintained a certain level of secrecy, making it all the more difficult to discern what shadow banning actually is or looks like. So for Meta, first of all, mm -hmm. public enemy number one, <laughs> In 2018, Meta became one of the first social media companies to admit that across Facebook and Instagram, they algorithmically reduced user engagement with, quote, borderline content. They didn't explicitly say shadow banning. Mark Zuckerberg said this included, quote, sensationalist and provocative content. But despite Meta persistently refuting allegations of shadow banning, the company submitted a patent on July 16, 2019 that appears to indicate some level of shadow banning. Instead, it is labeled as moderating content in an online forum. So the abstract for this patent reads, quote, for example, the social networking system may may receive a list of prescribed content and block comments containing the prescribed content by reducing the distribution of those comments to other viewing users. However, the social networking system may display blocked content to the commenting user such that the commenting user is not made aware that his or her comment was blocked, thereby providing fewer incentives to the commenting user to spam the page or attempt to circumvent the social networking system filters. Let's think about that because that is almost exactly our understanding of shadow banning. Yeah, like shadow banning at its core is just when a user has been suppressed or blocked, but they are not made 
without that aware. knowledge. Yeah, yes. of that. Completely. And then in 2020, head of Instagram, Adam Masseri, said in an Instagram story that, quote, shadow banning is not a thing. Okay, Adam. Okay. Masseri expanded on Instagram's ranking policy in a blog post in May of this year. The blog post begins with Masseri explaining Instagram's algorithm, confirming that the app doesn't have a, quote, singular algorithm that oversees what people do and don't see on the app. He goes on to explain that each part of the app, feed, stories, explore, reels, search, and more, uses its own algorithm tailored to how people use it. Before going on to address shadow banning specifically, Masseri explains how each aspect of the app ranks posts in a more depth. He points to aspects like a user's previous activity and interaction and the information in the post. When it comes to shadow banning, Masseri confirms that it's not Instagram's intention to limit or hide content without a clear explanation or justification. Quote, contrary to what you might have heard, it's in our interest as a business to ensure creators are able to reach their audiences and get discovered so they can continue to grow and thrive on Instagram. And then he went on to address the community's concerns regarding shadow banning, promising that Instagram will increase transparency and provide support to creators who believe they have been shadow banned. He points to features like account status, which is meant to, quote, help you understand why your account's content may not be eligible to be recommended. It's such bullshit. I know. I mean, I don't even know why they try at this point. It's also not creators that are making you money because yeah. creators post branded content that they get the money for. It's yeah. users that are making you money. So the fact that you've said obviously you're trying to engage creators in some component, like that is a part of, you know, audience development in some ways. Yeah, and yeah the ecosystem. But primarily like that's not what these companies' focus is at yeah. the end of the day. Okay, so Twitter – Users have also long called out Twitter for shadow banning users. So a now defunct website, shadowban.eu, allowed Twitter users to check whether their posts and comments were being hidden. So a study, a French study crawled more than 2.5 million Twitter profiles and found that nearly one in 40 had been shadow banned in these ways. The same study found that accounts that interacted with someone who had been shadow banned were nearly four times more likely to be shadow banned themselves. And that's from an Atlantic piece. Wow. Wow. So it, Actually, maybe I'm like talking so much shit. I'm like, this is people's excuse for low engagement. But like there's such high numbers. All these people probably have actually been shadow banned. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say that it's mostly people complaining about being shadow banned on Twitter, though, because a lot of like general people don't use Twitter. I don't know how to explain it, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, in 2018, Twitter was accused of shadow banning, quote, famous Republicans by preventing their account names from auto-populating within the website's search bar. Twitter attempted to set the record straight in a blog post claiming they do not shadow ban, but they do rank tweets. It essentially uses how other accounts interact with you and who follows you to guess whether a user is engaging in healthy conversation online. And then Twitter's ex-CEO Jack Dorsey also admitted in some sort of restriction on the platform in September 2018. So he tweeted, quote, in the spirit of accountability and transparency, recently we failed our intended impartiality. Our algorithms were unfairly filtering 600,000 accounts, including some members oh. of Congress, from our search autocomplete and latest results. We fixed it, but how did it happen? We build our policies and rules with a principle of impartiality. Uh, objective criteria rather than on the basis of bias, prejudice or preferring the benefits to one person over another for improper reasons. If we learn we fail to create impartial outcomes, we work hard to fix. It's like I get that there are always going to be wild moderation issues when you have a platform that is this big. Like mm. I completely understand that it is hard for the platforms as well. But I just think where I lie is if you are raising millions of dollars to build this platform and you are then making millions of dollars for this platform, like you have a responsibility to the user and to just like the general world, just the ecosystem that you're fostering and developing to provide a safer space. Yeah, to, to work th those issues yeah. out. Like yeah. I, I understand it feels like an impossible task and that is where these platforms get away with it. They just kind of have to say, 
everything is too big. We have way too many users. There's always going to be issues with moderation. Like we're kind of hands off in this case. We do the best we can, but like there's nothing else we can do. We can't control people. Like that's how they get around the accountability of it, but they need to take accountability. Yeah, like, there needs to be like a cap on users until they can figure out how that they can include the next tier of users yeah. and effectively moderate. But it's also bold of you to assume that big tech has a moral conscience, Lauren. Oh God, true. To the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. I was actually listening to, I think it's called Hard Fork, the New York Times tech oh, yeah. podcast this morning. And they were talking about how these social platforms are like so overwhelmed and consumed with like jealousy and panic because ChatGPT and AI yeah. are these new up and coming developments. Like it's insane that we have ChatGPT that exists and can write whole essays but can't moderate effectively on a social media True. platform. But they were saying that – um social platforms are losing their mind because AI and the development and the monetization of this technology doesn't rely on advertisers. So they can be selling programs like Siri or they could be selling, you know, right. they have this new piece of hardware that's essentially like Siri in like a pin mm. that you pin on you that is kind of giving like Jarvis from Iron Man, like yeah, talks yeah. to you on the go. You don't need a screen for it. It engages with you out in your real, out, out in the real world. So I think that kind of competition too, where we're seeing like tech develop past social media mm -hmm. is also putting a lot more pressure on social platforms to sort yes. their shit out because like people I mean I don't see a world where we ever move past social media no. but it is starting to be a realistic like Silicon Valley conversation is like if you don't keep up yeah like adapt or die. I think the conversation seems to be moving towards like, what do we actually use social media for? I saw a TikTok last night of a girl talking about how, you know, print magazines are coming back, right? Mm -hmm. there, that's been like a big conversation. And she said, I do think they are coming back. I think print is coming back because what is happening now is social media essentially like filled the gap of, of magazines mm. and print media for a long time, but people don't go on social media to be social anymore. Like mm. when you open every single app, you don't see your friends, yeah. you see random people. Yeah. Right. So she was saying, you know, the, it's changing so much. It's evolving so much. People are going to other apps like Geneva discord to like actually build those communities. What people are using social media for is a launch pad to drive people to other locations. Mm -hmm. They're using it as a marketing tool now, as opposed to a place to like be social or a place of discoverability, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're going on TikTok, and if you're really into podcasts, you you end up on the podcast algorithm so that you can then find podcasts to go listen to yeah. as opposed to TikTok becoming your entertainment. So it was really interesting because I think it goes hand in hand with this conversation of like so social media platforms. They were like the be all and end all for so long. Mm -hmm. And now like you said, things are moving on. Yeah, like yeah, we're yeah. we're outgrowing them in a way. Well, and a lot of that comes down to you know, like the the AI conversation is so centered around ethics and what this is going to look like ethically moving forward. And the fact that big tech so far to this point has just managed to like circumvent any kind of ethical conversation yeah. and like get away with it, I think is speaking to the fact that like we we're getting over there. We can't keep living like this. Everyone's exhausted yeah. and depressed and wants to be like off their screen, but yes. we're like sucked in in a way that kind of means that we can't. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem, right? Like you just can't be offline. Yeah, completely. Well, we need to move our online spaces to like healthier, yeah. you know, into healthier practices and platforms and routines. So the conversation around shadow ban, speaking about ethics, uh, on Twitter was reignited under Elon Musk, of course, mm -hmm. specifically after the release of the Twitter files through December 2022 to the beginning of 2023. So CBS News reports, quote, the Twitter files have been released in dribs and drabs throughout December with three journalists, Matt Taibbi, Barry Weiss and Michael Schellenberger, delving into the internal documents and discussions to highlight the company's decision making process around some high profile actions, such as banning former President Donald Trump in January 2020. So according to Weiss, Twitter had teams of employees build blacklists, prevent disfavored tweets from twenty from trending and actively limit the visibility of entire accounts or even trending topics all in secret without informing users. She goes on to note that Twitter has denied claims of shadow banning on the premise of the definition itself. Quote, what many people call shadow banning, Twitter executives and employees call visibility filtering. Oh my God. Or VF. Multiple high level sources confirmed its meaning. Okay. Okay. 
like tomato tomato I like know. you guys are like this is insane but that's why they're getting away on a technicality because yeah. their company doesn't call it shadow banning well and even i see why am i did an episode on algo speak and they had two linguists come on and speak about you know the changing language and they're like you know, this is why as linguists like language is so important yes. because it means you either evade or take accountability yes. in so many circumstances and rewording it like by the teeniest little bit basically means that they're like home free oh my god which is infuriating uh so what the twitter files showed internet users was that much of the discourse around shadow banning comes down to semantics like we were just saying so leaving the platforms focused on definitions and quote performing transparency as opposed to providing genuine guidance guidelines around ranking posts and shadow banning yeah and every platform's community guidelines if you ever read them which i have occasionally for like reporting on centennial or whatever are so vague mm. and they're intentionally vague yeah completely because they want to be able to pick and choose yeah. what fits that definition okay and then tiktok is the last example so in 2020 internal documents were leaked indicating that tiktok restricted videos featuring people with quote ugly facial looks too many wrinkles abnormal body shapes or backgrounds featuring slums or dilapidated housing from appearing in users for you feeds so that was published on the intercept tiktok has since said that it has retired these standards but I'm actually surprised they even admitted to it at all given what we've just like discussed. Well it's because like the Intercept literally like obtained documents like and they published them so like you can't deny that. No Those denying. are formal documents. I mean the Twitter files like were internal documents and they still True. like work their way around it you know like so um, that's but one small tick for TikTok. The wildest thing is when we were talking we were researching for this episode talking to Annabelle about it and she was like, did you know this about TikTok? Yeah. And we were like, yes, like we did know this. I remember it was a big story. I think yeah. we covered it in some capacity on site and probably on the podcast at the time. But the fact that Annabelle, who is an internet culture journalist, did not know about this, like the general public does not know that these mm. documents get leaked. They just get squashed right away. Yeah. Even when like there's huge exposés, I don't know how, but like things just do not seep out. Yeah, and I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that uh, news and social media are so deeply intertwined now. Like so many people find their news yes, via true. social media that if say Twitter doesn't want you to know about the Twitter files, obviously the that's not going to make it onto yeah. the trending page, you know, yeah. even if that is like the biggest story that everyone's talking about. And then like we said too, like even being in the community guidelines, like it does all feel like so convoluted or vague, like what's the point anyway? So I feel like yeah. people see these stories and they're like, well, I'm not going to understand how that relates to me. So they don't bother. We are a conspiracy theory podcast. Oh, no. Whenever we talk about anything big tech, I feel like I have my tinfoil hat on. But the more that I do this podcast and like am entrenched in this space, the more I'm like, oh no, like this, this is actually not conspiracy theories. Like this no. is true. It's, there's literally like articles and documents and like verified. Yeah. Sources. Sources yeah. saying that these guys are shady as fuck, but they like run the world. Yeah. And you just, I don't know, just me, like my default is to give people the benefit of the doubt. Like I don't want to believe that there's people out there that are intentionally doing this oh and God, being so, so fucked. That's so nice of you. <laughs> Capitalism. That's baby. why I hate a conspiracy <laughs> theory. I just think it's like so cynical, but no, like this is bad. No, we have to be cynical. You're right. Especially when it comes to fucking Zuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So as for why platforms shadow ban content, at a basic level, it's a way for platforms to moderate a user or content without having to ban or remove them. So the earliest example of shadow banning was from the mid 1980s. A BBS forum had a quote twit bit for problematic users, which when enabled would limit the user's access while still allowing them to read public discussions. However, any messages posted by that twit would not be visible to the other members of that group. One of my favorite terms too in looking at why content is shadow banned is it being described as lawful but awful. Yeah. So it's not something that they can actually remove based on, you know, their own guidelines, whatever that looks like. But it's not something that's good for the platform, good for the creator, like bad vibes 
by their standards. Yeah. So these users or the content doesn't technically violate community guidelines, but the platform doesn't want it shown to many users. So for example, Twitter and TikTok don't like it when users direct people to their OnlyFans because it makes the platforms less advertiser friendly. And it highlights how loosey goosey Twitter and TikTok's age verification protocols are. Directing someone to your OnlyFans doesn't violate guidelines unless you're posting actual pornographic content uh, so they can't technically de-platform the creator but they can suppress the content so it mitigates the risk for the platform it's also just kind of rule number one of social media is you know you want to keep the user on the platform slot machine mentality there's lots of triggers anyone's watched uh the facebook documentary mm. will know all the techniques and tools and lights and sounds and mm-hmm. push notifications to try and keep people engaged and spending time on the platform because that means you can get served more ads in theory yeah. they can make more money so anything that's trying to drive people off platform is something that they don't want and then on top of that you know obviously the nature of OnlyFans isn't particularly brand safe for said advertisers. So that would be an example of like lawful but awful by their terms, not yeah. lawful but awful by like normal people terms. Yes, totally. Okay, so what are some prominent examples of shadow banning? There's a few different categories that we're going to look at, but the first is political shadow banning. So as Jordy mentioned before, there was a whole thing on Twitter about conservative politicians. I'll go into it a little bit deeper and like how this got found out. So in 2018, Twitter stopped autofilling the usernames of U.S. politicians Jim Jordan, Mark Meadows and Matt Gates, as well as other prominent Republicans in its search bar. This discovery was published by Vice News, who claimed they no longer appeared in the auto-populated drop-down search men- menu on Twitter, thus limiting their visibility when being searched for. Vice News alleged that this was the case of shadow banning. After the story, some conservatives accused Twitter of enacting a shadow ban on Republican accounts, a claim which Twitter denied. However, some accounts that were not overtly political or conservative apparently had the same algorithm applied to them. Numerous news outlets, however, including the New York Times, The Guardian, BuzzFeed News, and Gadget and New York Magazine disputed the Vice News story, which I just, I wanted to include that because I found that really interesting. Mm, It is. Like the fact that they all said, no, this was not shadow banning. Because my understanding on Twitter is if you type someone's name in like Trisha Paytas, which I'm going to get to in a minute, when you type someone's name into the search bar and they don't show up, but they have an account, that is shadow, that's a type of shadow banning. Yeah, but I'm I am curious because obviously Vice is like a left leaning publication. I know. I feel like there's some media conspiracy going on, like being in beds with the platforms. Yeah. They're probably like, oh, the Republicans are just crying wolf, you know. There's something going on there. Yeah. And then when it comes to TikTok, Black Lives Matter activists have been accusing the platform of shadow banning their content since 2020. At the height of the George Floyd protests, it reduced how often their videos appeared on the For You page. TikTok and Twitter both claimed that these were large scale technical glitches. TikTok and Twitter? So Twitter said this about... About the conservative shadow banning. Mm -hmm. And TikTok said this about suppressing Black Lives Matter content. So just taking you guys back to that tweet that Jack Dorsey wrote in reaction to members of Congress being banned. He said our algorithms were unfairly filtering 600,000 accounts, including some members of of Congress from our search autocomplete and latest results. So like at least he addressed it. I mean, that's like the bar is literally on the floor, Yeah, but it is very much avoiding any kind of accountability by saying that it was kind of a glitch in the system. Yeah, and that's what TikTok said too. They wrote a blog post basically saying it was like a glitch. In 2021, TikTokers with the word black in their bios reported that their content was frequently being flagged as inappropriate. In 2022, TikTok Germany was allegedly shadow banning content in support of the LGBTQ movement, blocking content with the keywords gay, queer, LGBTQ, and homosexual. More recently, social media users across meta platforms and TikTok believe that their content about the Israel-Hamas war is being shadow banned or censored. So Morgan Sung wrote for TechCrunch, quote, in response to the escalating violence, Meta said that it is closely monitoring its platforms for violations and may inadvertently flag certain content, but it never intends to suppress a particular community or point of view. Users have also complained that they've been harassed and reported for posting content about Palestine, regardless of whether or not it violates Meta's policies. 
So those are some kind of like political activist examples mm. of times when either the platforms have admitted it or not, but when it's pretty obvious that they're shadow banning certain movements or certain like, types of people. Yeah, or like points of view yeah, as well, right? View. And by doing that, I guess the power in shadow banning that kind of content and what we saw with Black Lives Matter was social media was really this force for, you know, momentum. Yeah. And by taking that power away, you don't allow people to find each other. You don't allow new people to discover those kinds of perspectives or voices. And, you know, this this could sometimes be dangerous in some respects but in this case specifically it was really kind of halting the growth of a movement totally um which we saw you know black lives matter prevailed but that was against everything big tech essentially tried to do <laughs> yeah literally okay the next type of shadow banning that is so prevalent is shadow banning sex workers. Sex workers have been accusing platforms of shadow banning since forever, saying that they hide their content from hashtags, disable their ability to post comments and prevent their posts from appearing in feeds. Okay, we're get, about to get a little bit legal here. <laughs> this so is a legal podcast. Bear with me. Also, <laughs> it's so crazy that we know Foster as a law from the Balenciaga of it all. Like oh I was my God, like, yes. how is this in my brain already? Yeah, how is this all tied together? So in 2018, again, 2018 was a big year for big tech. Mm. In 2018, the U.S. introduced FOSTA and SESTA. FOSTA stands for Allow States and Victims to Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, and SESTA stands for Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act. These were both U.S. Senate and House bills, which became law on April 11th, 2018. They clarify the country's sex trafficking law to make it illegal to knowingly assist, facilitate, and support sex trafficking and amend the Section 230 Safe Harbors of the Communications Decency Act, which make online services immune from civil liability for their actions to their users, to exclude enforcement of federal or state sex trafficking laws from its immunity. Okay, so that's like legal jargon, like yeah. very convoluted, yeah. but basically in theory, these acts should be good. Like mm -hmm. they should be helping prevent human trafficking, sex trafficking. Anyone tied online. to any, like any of those acts online. Yes. However, many sex workers say that the introduction of these bills has greatly impacted their work as platforms are now like low key using these laws as a catch all excuse to ban their accounts or deplatform them altogether. So according to Hacking and Hustling, quote, FOSTA broadly expanded civil and criminal liability for websites with user generated content, including Twitter, Instagram, and many sites that sex workers advertise their services on. FOSTA is just one part of a larger Phobic ecosystem that facilitates the erasure of sex workers from online spaces. FOSTA follows a broader trend of sex workers losing access to online spaces, such as the FBI ratings of Rent Boy, Backpage, and Eros. A 2020 study by Hacking and Hustling titled Erased found that 94% of online respondents say they advertise sex work related services using online public platforms and social media. 99% do not feel safer because of FOSTA. 72.45% say FOSTA plays a role in their increased economic instability. 80.61% are now facing increased difficulties advertising their services, and 21% are not able to access online harm reduction anymore. Those are insane stats. Yeah. And this was like a massive research paper that I was reading. Like this was quite, I, I believe, at least representative mm. of the industry in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So the study showed how FOSTA, quote, encourages platforms to contribute to the silencing and speech chilling of survivors, sex workers, and sex working survivors through erasing sex workers from the internet. There's already tremendous fear in the community as sex workers try to comply with and work around platform rules that are often opaque and enforced differently for different people. So basically, rather than platforms like taking ownership of their own moderation practices by finding better ways to verify a user's age, for example, or moderate nudity, all of that kind of stuff, they can now use these laws, which were put in place for a different reason. They mm. are not in theory supposed to be like silencing sex workers or making it harder for them to work. They can now use these laws to justify getting rid of or suppressing all not safe for work content. Or even safe for work content that drives at some point to not safe for work content. Yes, true. Like that's the thing. And this is, this is kind of where the double standard is really, really evident is say, Alex Earl mm -hmm. will post a TikTok in a bikini yes. 
and then we'll share like a clip of that as part of a news story and our video will be struck. Yeah. So it's like there's no kind of consistency as far as the rules are concerned but certain people often, you know, are able to post a certain way and that's not a problem. Yeah, and even the people that work at the platforms, like obviously there are people that work at these platforms that know what's happening. But even us, for example, we have a dedicated like TikTok account manager. And when our videos get struck, we'll approach her and be like, why did this happen? Mm. Can you fix it? Can you fix it? Can you make sure that our account doesn't get taken down because we get so many strikes? Like whatever, like why is this happening? And she literally cannot give us answers. She'll be like, I don't know why this video was struck. Yeah. Not sure. It didn't violate any of the guidelines. Sorry. Yeah. Literally like, okay. (laughs) Wipe your hands. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so impossible. Yes. Okay. And then when it comes to shadow banning creators, a lot of big creators, as we know, will cry shadow ban when their content stops doing as well or their engagement drops. So Elaine Moore wrote for the financial times quote, like Uber drivers and delivery couriers, social media influencers are at the mercy of algorithms. This makes them perfect fodder for conspiracy theories. It also makes sense that influencers would be baffled by any sudden decrease in engagement and spooked by changes that might jeopardize the brand deals they sign. Instead of believing that their own popularity is waning, some cling to the idea that shadow bans are a disciplinary measure that is used against creators who do not warrant an outright ban of the platform. I kind of disagree with that though. Me too. Because I definitely think creators are hyper aware of the evolu- like the evolving landscape and how they have to keep up. I don't think they're like ignorant to or immune to the fact that the goalposts are changing. Yeah. Like I think platforms and industry insiders like may brand these concerns as like conspiracy theories as Elaine Moore said, but there are so many instances that we can point to where creators are pretty obviously shadow banned. Yeah, completely. And I think like Yes, it does affect brand deals, but they're also like they're aware of the system within which they're operating. They know that their brand deals rely on uh, a platform that they don't own and is inconsistent. Like we can't discount the savviness that creators have in responding to these changes, right? And also their rights. Like I understand that they are building a life and an income that is so, for some of them, like the top tier creators, that is so much more than like the average person could ever imagine. So I think a lot of people don't have like sympathy for creators Mm. when things change for them. But I'm still very much of the mindset of like, imagine you just went to work one day and your company was like, we're slashing everybody's salaries by 40% and changing all the rules now. And you had to just go along with it. You couldn't get another job. Like that is just so unfair because these platforms, they are nothing without creators. If you are pushing all of your creators away so much where they have to go get full-time jobs because they can't afford to keep doing YouTube full-time or TikTok full-time or whatever they used to be doing because you keep changing the fucking rules on them Mm -hmm. and taking their money away. Like your platform is going to infinitely change. You are going to lose what made the platform special to begin with, what made users excited to to use it to begin with. If all of these creators who they love can't dedicate so much time to these platforms anymore. Yeah, I completely agree. I just, it's definitely like they just are taking advantage of the people that have like brought in the audiences to their platforms to make that money. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So two examples that we're just off the top of my head. I'm sure there are many more of creators that have been shadow banned Trisha Paytas, my girl, can't be an episode without me mentioning Trisha Paytas. <laughs> she has been shadow banned on Twitter and Instagram for literally years. When you type her name into Twitter, she just doesn't come up. Like she has a Twitter account. And she's very active on it. You cannot find her if you type her name into Twitter. Does she come up on your like for you page? Yeah, on, on TikTok. Yeah, yeah but yeah, not, yeah. On not on Twitter. Not on Twitter. She's been shadow banned on Twitter for a long time because she's always trying to drive people, like we said before, to her OnlyFans. I Mm -hmm. think that's why she started getting banned on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years ago, she also had to fully move to her backup Instagram account, Trisha Paytas Backup, because her main account was shadow banned for so long. (laughs) That she just like wasn't getting anywhere with it. Yeah. And I think it's like kind of deleted now. I don't know. Her account was like messed up. Okay. And then the next creator, this is like a crazy story. Some of you guys, if you've been like deep in the YouTube lore for a while, might remember this. 
But commentary creator Swoop, she has such an interesting story when it comes to her channel being shadow banned. So before the channel Swoop, she was creating content on a channel called Spanky Valentine TV for around seven years. She had over 600,000 subscribers and this was her full-time job. And then in November 2016, she uploaded a video as normal and she claims that her views were like instantaneously cut by 99%. Quote, this trend continued every single upload that I posted since then, even though I was doing everything by the book, she explained in a May 2018 video. She said she had spent so long reaching out to YouTube and no one would give her an answer except to say we've never seen this before. She says she finally met someone on the engineering team at Google that worked closely with the algorithms. Quote, I was told on this specific date in November of 2016, my channel got instantaneously dropped out of all home screens, out of all search and recommended, out of all browse features, out of everything. And it was explained to me that this was an algorithmic anomaly that is basically the equivalent of being struck by lightning. So if you kind of read around that, YouTube is saying it was a glitch. Just a glitch. And she was basically told she needed to start a new channel. So she did. So this is really interesting because this is an example of like, in theory, automated moderation that absolutely fucked someone for apparently no reason or no reason that she will ever be given. I wouldn't go back. Like I know that's like, I know. that's where you build your audience. That's where you're the most comfortable and familiar with. And that's where you know how to continue growing an audience and creating content for. But fuck, you'd be so pissed. I know. Like imagine becoming like, I don't know, a C-suite executive and then one day you get told you have to be the intern again. Yes, totally. Exactly. Building a channel from the ground up again after you already did that for seven years. In a different time, Yeah. right? Like where the circumstances are different, it's harder. Mm -hmm. Like whether or not she was a part of that initial boom yeah. um, and kind of got lifted up with that first kind of wave of true creators or first wave of like commentary creators or whatever, but like, Oh, I know. And for Trisha, like, I don't think being shadow banned necessarily harms her in a lot of ways because she's such like a well-known name. Like yeah. she's like kind of famous outside of like her content. But for somebody like Swoop, like Spanky Valentine, like she was just like truly like a YouTuber. Mm -hmm. Patricia kind of adds to her brand, honestly. It does. A hundred percent. It adds this, this layer of mystery to Trisha where there's literally no other mystery about her. You yeah, know, yeah. every single like most <laughs> moment of unwellness in her life yeah. but like the shadow ban is just like this random hilarious addition it just tracks you yeah know? truly okay so there are obviously lots of ethical implications of shadow banning some of which we have like just listed thrown off out. yeah just thrown out there in this episode but shadow banning is controversial in the big tech space because it's obviously a form of censorship one of the biggest arguments against shadow banning is that platforms do it but they won't give answers into why they shadow ban certain accounts or any insight into their algorithms that are apparently making these decisions and like glitching on us right so many people believe that platforms keep their community guidelines, like I said before, ambiguous on purpose so they can moderate or shadow ban freely. Jonathan Zittrain, a professor of computer science and law at Harvard University, told the New York Times, quote, the very notion that our online activity can be manipulated by a platform without our knowing, it can be unnerving. Shadow banning is the worry by any user that they are howling into the void that they have been placed in a bubble and it's undisclosed. It's so true. Like imagine just like screaming at the top of your lungs for help. I mean, this is like a grim example yeah. and no one can hear you. Like yeah. you would feel like a crazy person. I do think that there is psychological effects that we're going to see the ramifications yes. of in coming years about people thinking that they're putting content out into the world that is reaching people and it just is not going anywhere. Yeah, totally. But when we consider the amount of like racist or discriminatory content on the internet, some argue that shadow banning might be a necessary evil. So Gabriel Nicholas writes for The Atlantic, quote, shadow banning allows platforms to suppress harmful content without giving the people who post it a playbook for how to evade detection next time. 
The automation of shadow banning can also protect the employees who work in moderation teams at these companies. So, I mean, this is no surprise, but like more and more people who work in moderation for these platforms are speaking out about the mental health issues that they face from being exposed to like traumatic content and also being overworked, which I think is a really big part of that. Mm. But in 2020, for example, a former YouTube content moderator who worked for the platform on a contract basis from 2018 to 2019 sued YouTube accusing it of failing to protect workers who moderate violent videos posted to the site. In the lawsuit, she said that they were required to watch murders, abortions, child rape, animal mutilation, and suicides. As part of moderator training, the company allegedly presented a video of a, quote, smashed open skull with people eating from it. Oh, my God. A woman who was kidnapped and beheaded by a cartel and a person's head being run over by a tank. Oh my God. She claims she experienced nightmares, panic attacks, and is unable to be in crowded areas as a result of her work with YouTube. She also claimed YouTube's wellness coaches weren't available for people who worked evening shifts and were not licensed to provide professional medical guidance. Moderators allegedly had to pay out of pocket when they sought professional help. The lawsuit also revealed that YouTube expects each moderator to review 100 to 300 pieces of video content each day with an error rate of 2% to 5%. So obviously, if platforms can further automate their moderation, that is in a lot of people's best interest, right? Like, especially if they're not willing to invest in keeping their moderators safe and protected, like automation seems like the best answer. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, A, automation has proven to be just as biased as human moderation. Mm -hmm. And B, we don't actually know if shadow banning is automated or not because every platform is so freaking secretive about it. Yeah, to me it seems like those horrific, traumatic things that this moderator is talking about are fairly obvious, like, no goes. Red flags, right? So as far as, you know, where shadow banning comes into effect, it's only for that borderline content anyway, which typically seems to be, like, more politically aligned. And obviously, like, when you've seen people like Andrew Tate rise to success and so little is done about it, what's the point of shadow banning? If that's the exact kind of content that you're trying to be like protecting people from in theory, then it's not doing its job. So you might as well be clear about the guidelines. Yeah, like these videos that she's naming, those should be so obviously not allowed on the platform. Yeah, like obviously if we can automate more and save moderators from going through something like that, absolutely. But whether shadow banning is automated or a human is doing it, it it kind of it that defeats that's like not the issue with the shadow banning of it all because the shadow banning issue is like where they draw the line. Yes. So whatever mechanism is drawing the line needs to be more transparent about it, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree with that. Because at first when I read that, I was like, oh my God, that's so true. Like sh- there is a place for shadow banning. Yeah. And I was like, wait a second, that those those things aren't the issue they're not the things being shadow banned they're the things like straight up being struck as they should be yes yes so it's like what is this gray area then what is the common thread of things that are being shadow banned yes true so from hacking and hustling they write quote it highlights the sisyphian task of complying to community guidelines that are intentionally vague and applied differently to different people this coupled with the ubiquitous cross-platform denial of shadow banning creates an environment of structural platform gaslighting which mirrors many relationships Relationships with power. This platform gaslighting is continued when accusations of shadow banning, reduced visibility, and down ranking are dismissed as a bug or a glitch. And then my issue with this is that it's such a knock on effect. So if one platform publicly denies it, it gives the others room to do so. Yes. Like while the platforms are all technically in opposition for relevant, like competition for relevance and ad dollars, they do also work in tandem and band together when it's something they're working to like keep a secret or get away with. Like the fact that Jack Dorsey made that statement in 2018 being like it was a glitch or like, you know, YouTube said the same thing about Swoop. TikTok can just copy paste yes, that excuse so them because they know what people's expectations are and how far they can push the envelope. Yeah. We need Congress in here. <laughs> To ban shadow banning and Finsta. Uh, Finsta. Ban Finsta. Don't ban Finsta. No. 
Okay, so the impacts of shadow banning. So in general, uh, Gabrielle Nicholas for The Atlantic writes, shadow banning fosters paranoia, erodes trust in social media and hurts all online discourse. It lends credence to... It lends credence to techno-libertarians who seek to undermine the practice of content moderation altogether, such as those who flock to alt-right social networks. And flocking to alt-right social networks is an interesting point because I would be so fascinated to know how like Truth Social, as an example, moderates its content. Like a big part of the political conversation, we're looking at this from the left with the likes of like BLM content being suppressed. But, you know, like QAnon people <laughs> people <laughs> have been claiming shadow banning and suppression for years and years too so if we look at platforms like twitter as in theory like a town square with a ton of different opinions coming together but on somewhere like true social where you think everyone flocks there because they have like a common train of thought or opinion mm-hmm. do they need shadow banning or moderation at all because the point is kind of that everyone agrees that's why people go True. There. maybe they'll shadow ban people that come in and try and like the moles like yeah like the left that's like sneaking on it yeah but then they're like i don't need truth social in my life and at the end of the day is that the goal of those people or platforms like even elon is like the promotion of free speech above all else like is that why we don't want shadow banning to exist and then are we actually the same as elon because we're all kind of fighting for the same thing. I mean, like, I know what you're saying, but Elon Musk is absolutely not against shadow banning. Like, when you... Like, there's been so many instances where, like, accounts that troll him or that are, like, parroting him are, like, banned True. from Twitter. Like, he wants free speech, he but, like, wa- he yes. blocks people. Yeah. But the point being that, like, he preaches free speech and we are anti-shadow banning, so we're also for free speech at the end of the day, you know? Like, it's kind of no, this, like, horseshoe. I'm not, like, anti-shadow banning. I mean, I guess in shadow banning in the term as we've discussed at length means that you don't know what's happening. Yeah. So I'm not We're just against shady moderation yes. techniques. I think there is actually a place for like suppressing not suppressing content, but like um I mean I guess it's suppressing content. If like people are posting but they're posting into a void. I don't know. Maybe maybe I am against that. I don't really know. But I feel like the big issue that I have with shadow banning is like not letting a user know that they're shadow banned. Yeah, and yeah, not yeah. letting them know why. Yeah, completely. So the lack of transparency. Yeah, which is, you know, an ongoing issue. But one of the biggest impacts too of shadow banning is that it's altered the way that we speak. So auto automated moderation slash shadow banning has facilitated algo speak. And I think we've briefly touched on algo speak on the pod before but Mm -hmm. it is essentially quote code words used to avoid AI content moderation tools that flag user content for violating social media apps rules or which might be sensitive in nature so as the most as the most algorithmically driven platform, AlgoSpeak is particularly popular on TikTok. So mm-hmm. different examples of AlgoSpeak include segs for sex or unalive instead of died, corn versus porn, La Dolla Bean for <laughs> lesbian. <laughs> There's so many. Um, But many platforms tend to cast a wide net when looking at videos that might be flagged for hateful, racist and sexually explicit content. Like while it is important for this type of content to be taken off the app, mistakes are often made. And as a result, quote, content creators who make money have to carefully navigate what words can be used as their content could be removed and their accounts banned. Though TikTok does provide a way for content creators to appeal removed videos. But AlgoSpeak is a savvy way to kind of get around this algorithm shadow banning. But this sort of language has like all kinds of ramifications. It can lead to a lot of miscommunication. So Julia Fox fell victim to AlgoSpeak when she misunderstood the term mascara in January 2023. So for context, a TikTok user named Connor Whipple posted a video about his alleged sexual assault experience writing, quote, I gave this one girl mascara one time and it must have been so good that she decided that her and her friend should both try it without my consent. So mascara in this case was used as a code word for dick with Connor implying that he was sexually assaulted by a woman and her friend after he slept with the woman. So Julia was unaware that mascara was being used as a stand-in word and where she was called out for her remark and she ultimately ended up issuing an apology and kind of put it down to miscommunication. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly harmful because a lot of the discussions that use AlgoSpeak reflect the 
concerns of marginalized communities and it's just another way to kind of undermine the issues facing these groups. So as algo speak becomes more popular and replacement words morph into common slang, users are finding that they're having to get more creative to evade the filters, says Taylor Lorenz for the Washington Post. Uh, and then algo speak can obviously help elevate discussions within these groups by avoiding moderation. But coded language is also frequently used with bad intention, for example, by political extremists to spread hate. It also takes the severity yes. away from those kinds of issues, which are all obviously like deserve a lot of gravity and should be platformed in certain circumstances or within, you know, certain groups of people. But people say like grape or yeah. like unalive now as almost like a joke. Yes, totally. Like it's definitely like changed the severity of the word and we don't think about it with the same gravity that it, de it deserves to be discussed with. It also widens the gap between people in the know or those like chronically online and those who aren't because there's a barrier to understanding. Yeah. So if the point of being able to evade the algorithm and have these conversations about serious topics is that it becomes more of a mainstream conversation – Mainstream people don't know what the fuck you're talking about because totally. you're speaking in another language. Yeah. So it kind of defeats the purpose of evading the algorithm in that way and like kind of helping that conversation go viral. And then it's also an interesting concept because people are self-censoring, which could be a result of the platform's inconsistency, but it could also be a result of people wanting to feel like in the know or be a part of the community. It's like people's way of proving that they're online now. Yes. Which is like playing into like they're upset about moderation but then they're self-moderating mm -hmm. in a way that's having like more detrimental impacts as well. So the development of algo speak is just one kind of category of impact that's come out of shadow banning. But I actually don't think um, algo speak is like a positive, has had like a no, positive effect so. at the end of the day. It just like pisses me off so much that these platforms, they want it all. Like, mm. and they really just try and have it all at our expense. It's mm. like, you want to create a social media platform that has as many users as possible. You want to be the public town square for the entire fucking internet, mm. but you don't want to have any accountability. Or when responsibility. It comes, yeah, when it comes to the conversations that you are, like that people are going to have on these platforms because you want every single person in the entire world to be on the platform. They're obviously not going to just talk about the things that you think or your advertisers think are fine to talk about. So then you have to like suppress their content when they're discussing certain topics that like are discussed among communities and you want to build a community on your platform to make money. So then you suppress their content and they start using all these other words and then it changes how we look at like all these severe things, how marginalized communities are looked at, how they're responded to. It's so fucking insidious. Like it's so toxic. It's so fucking bad. Well, and it all comes down to, to advertiser money. Yes. Like and appealing to ad brands and ad money. So growth only matters so that they can sell more eyeballs to the advertisers so that they can make like more profit. So in theory, the whole thing is about making it brand safe which literally is not possible like you said when you have the whole world on a single platform yeah and you're trying to bring the internet to every community in the world mark zuckerberg that doesn't already have it so that they can join fucking facebook and instagram like it's actually so fucked up yeah and the fact that now like the gaslighting element is only possible when there's you know a power imbalance yes. obviously big big tech are the most powerful companies and people <laughs> in the world. Uh, so the fact that not only are they changing like the way that we communicate with each other online, they're changing our language. Yes. That, that's going to be something that we're going to look back on in decades and centuries to come being like, okay, when did people start? Like when did this transition start happening and why? Like the yeah. way that we communicate and the words that we use, like, we're going to be teaching our kids this. Like, I don't, that's so unhinged, like the way that it's infiltrated every element of our lives. It's not yeah. just isolated. Like shadow banning is having impacts. Like you can lock your phone, put on airplane mode and you're still going to be feeling the effects in like a day-to-day -day conversation totally. that you don't even realize. Totally. <sighs> I'm like so angry now at Big Tech. <laughs> I think the, the conclusion for me too is 100% like, I agree there's a place for shadow banning, but the lack of transparency 
It shouldn't be shadow banning. We should just yes. know what the rules are and yes. be able to play by. How can we play by the rules when we don't know what the fucking rules are? Exactly. That's You're at fucking the end with, of the day. And they're fucking with people's lives. Like yes. that's that's a thing. And like they probably don't see social media as like life or death or maybe they do. They probably do. They, they probably should. Understand. They probably understand like the responsibility that they hold but they would never admit that. But it's like they are literally fucking with life and death. They are fucking yeah. with people's lives at, in some circumstances. Yeah, completely, whether or not they acknowledge that. Justice for we all need the rules. We need to know the social media rules. <laughs> Give us the community guidelines in detail. Yeah. And also, like, I don't know, AI is terrifying as fuck to me, but maybe that is the direction that we need to move away because if we're not relying on advertiser money yeah. and things being brand safe anymore, True. then people can have, like, the conversations they want to have and that could change the way that we interact and it could change the way communities are built if we're not relying on brands to essentially sponsor Fund. the way that we yeah. talk to each other. That's so true. I feel like we all need to go back to paying for content. Mm. I mean, it is moving that way for sure, like with Patreon and stuff. People are getting more used to the idea of paying for content but I think that would make a huge difference like audience revenue mm. to prop up the creators that they love or yeah. whatever so that they're not reliant on advertisers and thus platforms become less reliant on advertisers and it all just becomes this knock on effect of like nobody needs TikTok and Twitter and Instagram anymore yeah. please please <laughs> obviously that includes us help some sisters out <laughs> <laughs> not that we have any way for you guys to pay us but <laughs> true true we have no function for that Okay, guys. Well, thank you so much for listening. We love you guys. We hope you liked this episode. It was definitely a bit of a rogue deep dive, but I think it was fun. Yeah, I think it was fun. I think every now and again, I'm like, we're having an important, you know, Convo. conversation. I think helping people understand, helping us understand by even doing this research mm -hmm. in the first place is really like enlightening. And yes. at the end of the day, the reason we started the business was to encourage critical thought about the role of social media and internet culture in the creator economy. And I think this kind of conversation, by the time we've wrapped it all up and screamed in our mic for a bit, I'm like, okay, we're fulfilling the mission statement. With this specific episode. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Michaela Naguera's Lashgate different story but <laughs> yeah. that was also fun <laughs> thank you so much for listening we love you guys so much and we will talk to you guys on Tuesday yeah, see you on Tuesday bye. thanks guys bye <laughs>